Are you bored with your workouts? If you're looking for a workout that keeps you engaged, excited, and motivated, plus a workout that's never boring and always a challenge, you've got to check out Fight Camp. Fight Camp brings the boxing gym to your living room. The boxing workout has always been ranked as one of the best ways to get in shape, and it's honestly one of the most fun ways to combine cardio and strength training. Fight Camp comes with everything you need to get started, including the best freestanding punching bag on the market, great boxing gloves, quick hand wraps, and unique tracking sensors that show you real-time progress and stats on any iOS device. If you've never boxed before, that's no problem. Their 12-week starter program teaches you the fundamentals of boxing while ensuring you get a great workout. Fight Camp offers flexible financing for as low as 0% APR. And right now, as a limited time offer, you can try Fight Camp for 30 days with their money-back guarantee. Just go to joinfightcamp.com slash casefile. That's right. Try Fight Camp for 30 days, and if you don't love it, they'll refund your money. Train like a fighter and turn your sweat into results. To try Fight Camp for 30 days, just go to joinfightcamp.com slash casefile. Joinfightcamp.com slash casefile. Our episodes deal with serious and often distressing incidents. If you feel at any time you need support, please contact your local crisis centre. For suggested phone numbers for confidential support, please see the show notes for this episode on your app or on our website. In early 1998, three Finnish tourists were sound asleep at the Cedar Lodge Hotel near California's Yosemite National Park. The trio consisted of two young girls and an older woman who was acting as their guardian. At around 2am, they woke to the sound of something rattling. It wasn't particularly loud, but the hotel's remote setting, surrounded by acres of woodland, meant that even quiet noises could cut through the silence like a buzzsaw. Like all of the rooms at the Cedar Lodge, the women's room opened to an outdoor parking lot that any passerby could pull into. They quickly realised that the rattling was coming from the front door of their room, just a few feet away. Someone was fiddling with the handle from the outside, trying to get in. The women had locked the door earlier, but this wasn't deterring the person on the other side. It sounded as though they were trying to gain access with a key as opposed to using a tool or brute force. The older woman cried out in panic before calling the front desk. She informed hotel staff that someone was breaking into their room. But by this point, the rattling had stopped. If someone had indeed tried to break in, they were gone by the time security was notified. No one was found loitering in the area, nor seen sprinting away. The hotel's maintenance man checked the door. The lock appeared untouched and was still fully functional, which put the women at ease. Their night continued without any further interruptions, and no other suspected break-ins were reported. In December 1998, Silvina Peloso left her home city of Cordoba, Argentina, bound for the United States. The 16-year-old had inherited her mother's spirit for travel and had signed up to be a foreign exchange student. For the next three months, 
Sylvina would be living with the six-member Sunder family in the northern Californian port city of Eureka. The Pelosos and Sons were longtime friends through mothers Raquel and Carol. The two women met in the 70s when Carol travelled to Argentina as an exchange student herself. Carol revisited the country years later with her two-year-old daughter, Juliana, better known as Julie. By this stage, the Pelosos had two daughters, with Silvina the younger of the pair. She and Julie Sund were similar in age, but opposites in personality. Silvina was an introvert, unlike Julie, who was more outgoing. Despite their differences, the girls formed a lifelong friendship of their own. Sylvina was due to return home from the US in late March 1999. As she was very interested in American culture, the sons had endeavoured to give her a memorable experience of their homeland. They had taken Sylvina all across the state to visit landmarks such as Disneyland and Fisherman's Wharf. The Grand Canyon in Arizona was next on their list, as was Yosemite National Park. It took Carol Sund a month to meticulously plan the perfect road trip to Yosemite. Carol's schedule was typically full with family, work and other commitments, so she made the most out of every minute of her vacations. The Yosemite trip revolved around one of Julie's cheerleading competitions and would be taking place over four days that encompassed a long weekend. Only Carol, Julie and Sylvina would be going. It was set to be a unique adventure as winter had brought snow to the region. The trip began on Friday, February 12. Carol, Julie and Sylvina flew to San Francisco. From there, they hired a car and drove two hours northeast to Stockton. The city was home to the University of the Pacific, where Julie's cheerleading competition took place on Saturday, February 13. Julie was impressed by the campus and considered enrolling there after graduating high school. She had ambitions to become either a chef or an architect while maintaining her passion for violin and piano. Julie, Carol and Sylvina organised to return to the university for a proper tour in three days' time. From Stockton, the trio drove to the small farming town of Merced, known as the Gateway to Yosemite. They spent the night at the Ramada Inn before continuing on to Yosemite National Park on the Sunday. Sylvina was particularly excited to see Yosemite's granite cliffs, waterfalls, lakes, meadows and mountains. She was an active person by nature who enjoyed ice skating, skiing and roller skating. She also loved the outdoors and hoped to study an environmental field in the future. Carol, Julie and Sylvina spent their first day at Yosemite exploring part of the park's 750,000 acres of rugged wilderness. Before day's end, they drove through the dense and far-reaching forests along Highway 140 to the nearby town of El Portal. There, they checked in at the Cedar Lodge, an affordable hotel on the banks of the Merced River. On the evening of Monday, February 15, Jens Sund received a phone call from his wife, Carol. She happily spoke of her time away with the Julie and Sylvina in Yosemite. They had spent the previous two days exploring the park and were settling in for their final night at the hotel. Jens planned to meet the three women at San Francisco International Airport the next day. Carol and Julie would return home to Eureka, while Sylvina would join Jens and the other three sons children on a flight to Phoenix, Arizona to visit the Grand Canyon. 
Jens and his children flew in to San Francisco at 10.45pm on Tuesday, February 16. A storm had delayed their flight by five hours. There was no way to notify Carol as she didn't have a mobile phone. Instead, Jens paged his wife over the airport's loudspeaker, but there was no sign of her, Julie or Sylvina. The connecting flight to Phoenix was departing immediately. Jens faced a snap decision, board without Sylvina or wait and miss the flight. He decided to leave without her. His wife was very resourceful and fully capable of booking Sylvina on another flight. Jens awoke in Arizona the next morning and played a round of golf. He wasn't concerned about Carol, Julie or Sylvina until midday came and he still hadn't heard from them. Worried that they might have been in a car accident, he contacted the California Highway Patrol, but no incidents had been reported. Jens then called the Cedar Lodge in El Portal. He was informed that his wife and the girls had seemingly left the day before as planned. The lodge had Carol's credit card details on file, which meant she didn't need to physically check out at the front desk. She simply left the hotel keys in her room and her card was charged accordingly. Jens contacted the rental car company that Carol had used. She was supposed to drop the vehicle off in Modesto before her flight to San Francisco. The car hadn't yet been returned. It was out of character for Carol not to follow through with plans. The 42-year-old was diligent and reliable. As a mother of four and co-owner of a real estate company, she had to be. Carol also worked in the local courts as an advocate for abused children, volunteered as a parenting teacher and pursued other business interests. She was known for her charity work including a non-profit she co-founded that provided care and shelter for the mentally disabled. The sons notified the sheriff's department in Yosemite of the trio's disappearance. It was initially thought that Carol and the teens were lost or had skidded off the road. A large-scale multi-agency search commenced. Police officers and park rangers were on the lookout for Carol's rental car, a bright red 1998 Pontiac Grand Prix with Californian license plates. Highway Patrol drove down Highway 120, which runs through Yosemite, as well as Highway 140, which connects the Cedar Lodge with the park. There was no evidence of a vehicular accident or mishap anywhere. Records from the Cedar Lodge confirmed the women had checked in on the afternoon of Sunday, February 14. The lodge was at capacity due to it being both Valentine's Day and the President's Day long weekend. They were assigned to room 509, a twin bedroom away from the central reception area and car park. By Monday afternoon, Most of the hotel guests had checked out. Carol, Julie and Sylvina were the only ones remaining in their block. They rented some movies from the front desk and that evening, Julie and Sylvina ate at the hotel's restaurant. The pair were halfway through their dinner when Carol arrived to pay the bill at 6.32pm. Julie and Sylvina left with Carol, telling their server they would be back to finish their half-eaten burgers. But they never returned. Room 509 hadn't been touched since Carol and the teens had left. Police searched the room and found the rented movies on a table, along with a paper bag containing souvenirs. There were also wet towels on the bathroom floor and an apple and a bottle of tomato juice in the fridge. 
the group's luggage was gone and their room key had been left behind, as per the hotel's checkout policy. Police contacted the University of the Pacific in Stockton. The trio had scheduled to tour the campus hours before their flight back to San Francisco on the 16th, but they didn't show up. Their absence wasn't reported, as it was assumed they had simply made other plans. Thirty miles southeast of Stockton is the inland city of Modesto, the final destination on Carol, Julie and Sylvina's road trip. On Friday, February 19, a teen was walking to school in Modesto's northern suburbs. Near the intersection of main thoroughfares Briggsmore Avenue and Tully Road, she spotted the insert of a wallet containing several cards. Inside, were Carol's son's driver's license and credit cards, confirming it belonged to her. It was unclear whether the wallet insert had been lost, abandoned, or stolen. That same day, a call came through to the Wells Fargo bank helpline from someone claiming to be Carol's son. This person requested a duplicate ATM card be sent to her. But she was unable to provide proof of identity, so the call was terminated. Two days later, the person claiming to be Carol called the helpline again, wanting to know her bank balance. This time, she provided Carol's social security number and was given the information. When investigators learnt of the wallet insert and the helpline calls, they suspected Carol had met with foul play. It seemed likely that the caller seeking her ATM card and banking details was an imposter. Wells Fargo provided details of the 800,000 calls made to their helpline between February 19 and 21. Investigators whittled down the list and looked into over 100 people who might have placed the call, but their efforts were unsuccessful. Bank records revealed that Carol's last purchase were the burgers Julie and Sylvina ordered at the Cedar Lodge restaurant the evening before they vanished. She had also withdrawn $200 from an ATM in Merced before the group arrived at Yosemite. The cash was missing, but her credit cards hadn't been used, despite some having a $13,000 limit. The families of Carol, Julie and Sylvina descended on Yosemite seeking answers. Six days into the search, a visibly stunned Yen's son fronted a press conference. The National Park was a meaningful place for Yen's, as it was where he and Carol had honeymooned. He could offer no reason why his family would be targeted in a crime. He described his wife and daughter as fighters who wouldn't easily succumb to an assailant. The Eureka community was equally shocked. They couldn't understand how someone as cautious and protective as Carol could end up in trouble. Carol had come from the wealthy Carrington family. Her parents lived on a sprawling ranch north of Eureka, partially funded by their successful real estate business that Carol inherited. She and Jens ran the business side by side. The couple were also principals in the Carrington Co., which owned several malls across the country. Yet, the sons didn't indulge a lavish lifestyle. They lived in a modest, pale green bungalow with their two pet dogs. If the perpetrators were targeting the Carrington's wealth, they had yet to make any ransom demands. Carol's parents put their money to use, offering a $250,000 reward for information, no questions asked. The family also chartered a plane to conduct an aerial search of Yosemite, but nothing of significance was spotted. By now, 
the FBI were involved in the case. Over two dozen agents had arrived at Yosemite, led by Special Agent James Maddock. They set up a command post at a nearby hotel. The walls of a conference room were plastered floor to ceiling with a timeline of events. It detailed all sightings of the missing women that had come through to a 24-hour case hotline. On the final day of their trip, the trio were allegedly spotted in Yosemite Valley, a 30-minute drive east from the Cedar Lodge. They reportedly asked for directions to Tuolumne Grove, a riverside meadow just over an hour's drive away. A sporty red vehicle was also seen parked in a Yosemite Valley lot between midday and 2pm that same day. The possibility that the trio had a car accident once again gained momentum and further searches of the parkland were carried out. Recent snowstorms hindered efforts, but within two days, 4,000 miles of roadway had been driven and 50 miles of terrain trudged on foot. As planes and helicopters scanned from above, what looked like the burned out shell of a car was spotted along a back road. It turned out to be a propane tank. Special Agent Maddock told reporters, The territory here is huge, the territory is rugged, and the search is going to take some time. But if the car is out there, we'll find it. By Friday, February 26, Carol, Julie and Sylvina had been missing for 10 days. Nine abandoned or stolen cars had been found throughout Yosemite, but none were Carol's missing rental. While the likelihood of a car accident no longer seemed likely, it couldn't be ruled out entirely. Carol's car might have plunged into a remote canyon and remained hidden by shrubs or snow. Special Agent Maddock urged the public to check their properties and unused barns for the Red Pontiac, advising it may have been salvaged or dismantled. Carol's parents offered a further $50,000 reward for any information leading to the Pontiac's location. This was distinct from their reward for Carol, Julie and Sylvina's whereabouts, which they bolstered to $300,000. Alleged sightings continued to come in. A Best Western hotel clerk in Oakland believed the three women had approached the desk inquiring about room rates. Another person reported seeing them at a roadside fruit stand in Escalon. Both locations were in close proximity to Modesto, but neither sighting was confirmed. Yen Sund and others close to the missing women were subjected to polygraph testing and ruled out as suspects. Yen's was struggling to remain positive and often broke down. He prepared himself for the worst, telling his other children that they'd been lucky so far, but their lives were about to get harder. Carol was Yen's high school sweetheart. The couple had created their perfect family, starting with the birth of Julie in 1983, followed by the adoption of three more children. Carol was described as a supermom, and Jens wasn't sure how they'd cope without her. The son's grief was shared by the Peloso family. Sylvina's mother, Raquel, had arrived in California from Argentina. She was later joined by her husband, Sylvina's father, Jose. Raquel initially thought that her daughter had been in an accident. She told the press, The only thing I was afraid of was earthquakes in California. I trust the Sund family. I considered that they were going to take good care of my daughter. And I'm sure that they did. According to Raquel, Sylvina had never expressed concern about her time in America. It was her daughter's dream to go to the States. 
When Carol Sand made the trip to Argentina in the 70s, it was during an intense time of political turmoil. Raquel said, I can't help but think if Carol could come to Argentina and survive that experience, the guerrilla fighting, the shootings. How could my daughter not come to America and survive here? I have hope. I believe someone has seen something. In this world, you can do few things without a witness. As the end of February neared, 50 FBI agents were working the case. 7,000 miles of terrain had been covered and 900 tips generating 233 leads had been followed up. But authorities had yet to find any concrete evidence that a crime had even occurred. Special Agent Maddox stated that while the FBI held hopes of a miracle, they now believed that Carol and Julie Sund and Silvina Peloso were no longer alive. By March, investigators were growing frustrated. It was unusual for them to work so hard on a case without making a single breakthrough. Television program America's Most Wanted did a feature on the disappearance. This garnered national attention for the case, but no further breakthroughs. Victimology, the study of victim behaviour, was used to determine how the women might have reacted to various scenarios. Child abduction experts devised suspect profiles and background checks were carried out on those who raised suspicion. Persons of interest were interviewed and polygraphed. But they were all eliminated from the investigation. That month, the FBI set about interviewing employees of the Cedar Lodge and two suspects emerged. One was a staff member who had given Carol her room key. As it turned out, he was a registered sex offender. He had also visited Modesto two days before Carol's wallet insert was found there. The other suspect was a janitor named Billy Joe Strange. His history included domestic violence and battery. When investigators sought Strange for questioning in relation to the Sund Peloso case, he attempted to run. He was promptly captured and claimed that he'd fled because he didn't want to be hassled by the FBI. It was determined that Strange didn't have an alibi for the night the trio were last seen. He professed his innocence, but a polygraph test indicated that he wasn't being truthful. An associate claimed that Strange had talked about killing and raping women before hiding their bodies. Strange was interviewed several times but there was no evidence linking him to the disappearance and he was free to go. Locals who knew Strange were more inclined to believe that an outsider was responsible. In contrast, Strange's former mother-in-law described him as a violent man with a strong temper. She was suspicious of him from the moment news of the Sand Peloso disappearance hit. Days later, investigators searched Billy Joe Strange's cabin in El Portal, near the Cedar Lodge, and found cannabis. This breached Strange's parole conditions, which forbade him from using illicit drugs. He was placed under arrest, and a search was carried out on his janitorial shed at the hotel. Inside, a waterlogged laundry bag was found that appeared to have a blood stain. Stranger's girlfriend's car was also seized and another blood-like stain was spotted on the carpet. Analysis of the substance concluded it was rust. As the one-month anniversary of Carol, Julie and Sylvina's disappearance approached, a vigil for hope was held in Modesto. It highlighted multiple missing person cases 
with many attendees carrying photos of loved ones whose whereabouts were unknown. Yen Sund didn't appear at the event, citing emotional exhaustion. A poem written by his 13-year-old daughter Regina was read out to the 600-strong crowd. It said, At a time when I need my mother's touch most, all I see of her are pictures nailed to a post. When it is time for bed, I rock myself to sleep. I try to stay strong because I know that's what you'd want your baby to be. But mummy, I don't want you to leave me. On the afternoon of Thursday, March 18, retired carpenter Jim Powers was out target shooting near Dodge Ridge Ski Resort. Located approximately 110 miles south of the Cedar Lodge, The area in Tuolumne County is part of the Stanislaus National Forest. The forest spans almost 900,000 acres of woodland, rivers and streams. As Jim shuffled down a slope in some rugged terrain off Highway 180, something caught his eye. There were a few slivers of red paint and a license plate on the ground. Continue supporting restaurants in your community safely. There are thousands of restaurants open for delivery in DoorDash that need your patronage more than ever. Support your favourite restaurants on DoorDash. DoorDash is the app that brings you food you're craving right now, right to your door. Ordering is easy. Open the DoorDash app, choose what you want to eat, and your food will be left safely outside your door with the new contactless delivery drop-off setting. With over 300,000 partners in the US, Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia, you can support your local go-tos or choose from numerous national restaurants. Show your favourite restaurant some love and support during these hard times by ordering a meal you can enjoy at home. For a limited time, Listeners of Casefile can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code FILES. That's 25% off, up to $10 value, and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code FILES. Don't forget, that's code F-I-L-E-S for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. Do you experience stress or have anxiety or chronic pain or have trouble sleeping at least once a week? You're not alone. Many of us do. If you're searching for something to help, give feels a go. Feels is premium CBD delivered directly to your doorstep. It naturally reduces stress, anxiety, pain and sleeplessness. And Feels is really easy to take. All you need to do is place a few drops under your tongue and feel the difference within minutes. If you're new to CBD, Feels also has a free hotline to help with any questions you might have. Join the Feels community to have it delivered to your door every month. You'll save money on every order and you can pause or cancel at any time. Feels works naturally to help you feel better. There's no high, hangover or addiction. Feels has the case file team feeling their best every day and it can help you too. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash case file and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. That's F-A-A-L-S dot com slash case file to become a member and to get 50% automatically taken off your first order with free shipping. Feels dot com slash case file. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. 
BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can even start communicating in under 48 hours. BetterHelp isn't a crisis line or self-help. It's professional counselling done securely online. BetterHelp is available for anyone, anywhere in the world. Members of the Casefile team have signed up to BetterHelp and through the simple but detailed survey have found therapists that are perfect for what they need. It's been great to gain perspective from a different point of view and be able to bounce questions off someone who's helpful and friendly. Visit betterhelp.com slash casefile. That's better H-E-L-P. And to join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counsellors in all 50 states. As a special offer for case file listeners, get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash case file. When's the last time you got rewarded for brushing your teeth? With Quip's new smart electric toothbrush, good habits can earn you great perks, like free products, gift cards, and more. You've probably heard us talk about Quip a million times, but this is something brand new that rewards you and your mouth. The Quip smart brush for adults and kids connects to the Quip app via Bluetooth. This helps you track when and how well you brush and provides you with tips and coaching to improve your habits. Beyond the brush, Quip has everything you need to build a complete routine, including mint or watermelon flavoured toothpaste with anti-cavity ingredients for strong, healthy teeth, also floss that expands to clean and comes in a refillable dispenser to reduce waste. Plus, you can get the brush head, toothpaste and floss refills delivered from $5 and shipping is free. How smart is that? Start getting rewards for brushing your teeth today and go to getquip.com slash casefile right now to get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash casefile. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash casefile. Quip. Better oral health made simple and rewarding. Jim Powers eased deeper into the dense forest and came across the wreckage of a burned-out car. The intense fire had stripped the paint off of all but one of the door handles. All that remained was the rusting metal shell, with the interior soggy from recent rain. Jim examined the license plate. It read 4BMV025. His adrenaline surged. He recognised it from the missing person flyers that had been circulating the local community. With his stomach in knots, Jim took it back to his car and drove home to contact the authorities. FBI agents descended on the forest immediately. With the help of the highway patrol, they identified the destroyed vehicle as the Pontiac rented by Carol Sund. It had been missed during aerial searches due to the density of the forest ceiling above it. As a result of his discovery, Jim Powers was granted the $50,000 reward from Carol's parents. They called Jim their hero, as without the crucial find, the investigation would still be at a standstill. Jim said he would use the money to send his children to college. Arson investigators confirmed that the Pontiac's interior had been doused with gasoline before being deliberately torched. The heat from the flames had been so extreme that tree branches 25 feet above were scorched. This would have likely caused a forest fire had the surrounding woods not been covered with ice and snow. Finding a burned out item wasn't unusual for the area. 
It was known to be a dumping ground for old appliances and other junk, which locals often set on fire. However, a local man who lived across the road from where the car was found had noted a peculiar odour two to three weeks earlier. It was the smell of something burning, but was different to fireplace smoke. A woman's hiking boot and an intact can of Coca-Cola were found near the burned out car. As darkness fell, a full forensic examination of the scene was postponed until morning. Special Agent James Maddock told reporters that although there were no bodies found in the car, they now had incontrovertible evidence that Carol, Julie and Sylvina had fallen victim to a violent crime. With her daughter and companions still missing, Raquel Peloso told the press, I just hope they are kept somewhere and alive. The following morning of Friday, March 19, the Pontiac's trunk was opened for the first time. Inside were the remains of two badly burnt bodies. It couldn't be ascertained whether they were male or female, but investigators were certain they had found either Carol, Julie or Sylvina. It would take time to compare the remains with DNA and dental records before they would know for sure. The damage to both bodies was so immense that a cause of death could not be established. Due to the wintry conditions, a perimeter search of the forest surrounding the Pontiac was difficult. Recent snowfall had also masked any footprints or other evidence that might have been left by those responsible. The bad weather led to a temporary suspension of the search. The Sund and Peloso families were in mutual shock. Carol's mother told the media, No one is strong enough to cope with something like this. I can't imagine what kind of monster would do something like this. Special Agent James Maddock expressed his hope that the third victim would be found alive. The FBI faced criticism in the aftermath of the discovery. The day after the women were last seen at the Cedar Lodge, they were allegedly spotted at a Tuolumne County gas station and at a gift shop. Both locations weren't far from where the Pontiac was found. These sightings were reported to the tip line, but were never followed up. The FBI defended this decision, with Special Agent Maddox stating that all the reported sightings they received couldn't logically be true. The Tuolumne County community consisted mostly of retirees and small business owners, but a number of methamphetamine labs were also known to operate in the area. The possibility that the crime was drug-related was just one of many scenarios considered. Special Agent Maddock thought the women had been carjacked. He believed multiple perpetrators were involved, as it would have been difficult for one individual to wrangle all three women. The perpetrators were likely local to the area, as the location where the vehicle was destroyed wasn't a place outsiders would be familiar with. Within 24 hours of the vehicle being recovered, approximately 300 calls were placed to the FBI tip line. Although the FBI would remain involved to some degree, the case was officially handed over to the Tuolumne County Sheriff's Department. On Sunday, March 21, a change in the weather allowed the search of the scorched forest to recommence. Not far from the dumping site, Investigators came across several items of interest. The keys to the Pontiac, a handheld compact CD player, and an undamaged roll of camera film. The film was developed, revealing images of Carol, Julie and Sylvina taken between February 13 and 15. The pictures depicted the trio's time in Yosemite, 
posing in front of spectacular landscapes, playing in the snow, and ice skating on a frozen lake. One photo was taken the night before the women disappeared, presumably by Julie. It captured Carol and Sylvina in their hotel room at Cedar Lodge, sitting on the edge of their beds. It was a candid shot, with Carol in the midst of rummaging through her handbag. Yet, both women were acknowledging the camera with a smile. Seven of the photos recovered from the camera roll were given to the Sund family, with Carol's mother telling the press. I didn't want to look at the photos at first. Once I saw them, I was really delighted. These are beautiful pictures of our girls, and most likely, the last pictures we'll ever get. Jose Peloso sobbed when shown the images. The rest of the photographs were taken into evidence by the FBI, who refused to comment on what they showed. On March 21, a white cross and a vase of wildflowers were placed at the Pontiac dumping site by members of Carol, Julie and Sylvina's families. Carol's mother told the press, Carol was such a caring person. I just can't imagine the fear when she knew these girls were in trouble and couldn't do anything about it. The next day, Dental records confirmed that one of the two bodies found in the vehicle belonged to Carol Sund. Further DNA testing was required to verify the identity of the second victim. Two days later, on Wednesday, March 24, a letter arrived at the Modesto Police Department. Its envelope was postmarked March 16 and should have been delivered much earlier, but a mix-up at the post office delayed its arrival. Inside was a handwritten note in black ink on white-lined paper. The writing was untidy and was accompanied by a crudely drawn map. It directed police to the Vista Point lookout at Dom Pedro Reservoir in Tuolumne County. A line was marked to represent Highway 120. Above the map were the words, We had fun with this one. Analysis of the note failed to uncover anything significant. DNA found on the stamp and the envelope seal was run through the criminal database to no result. Investigators followed the map the next day arriving at the Dom Pedro Reservoir on the western edge of Yosemite National Park. It was around halfway between where Carol, Julie and Sylvina were last seen and the location where their burned out vehicle was found. Located just off Highway 120, Vista Point provided a scenic stop off for visitors wanting to soak in the views of the expansive waterfront and its bordering tree lined hillsides. It didn't contain much beyond a parking lot and a small hiking trail to the top of the hill. There were no direct access points to the water. A cadaver dog was taken down the steep, grassy hill that led to the reservoir. Within minutes, the canine made a discovery. Lying partly covered by a poison oak bush was the body of 15-year-old Julie Sund. Her throat had been cut, her ankles were duct taped together, and her arms had been folded neatly across her chest. Upon the identification of both Carol and Julie's son's remains, it was determined that the second body found in the Pontiac's trunk was that of 16-year-old Sylvina Peloso. Dark pink fibres were found on Julie's body, This prompted FBI agents to revisit the Cedar Lodge in search of Manchester that the fibres might have originated from. A maintenance worker took agents through each room where they stripped bedding and removed it from the premises to undergo analysis. 
The triple homicide would come to be known as the Yosemite Sightseer Murders. Yen Sund had no mercy for those responsible and hoped they would face capital punishment. Quote, The senseless waste of these precious lives is so incomprehensible. I can't even begin to understand why it happened. Julie Sund was laid to rest in a private ceremony at her maternal grandparents' Californian ranch. Carol's body had yet to be released by the FBI, but a place was reserved for her to be buried alongside her daughter. The next day, a public memorial service was held at Eureka's Sacred Heart Church, Julie's violin and Carol's gardening hat were placed at the altar. Daisies, Carol's favourite flower, were handed to the 1,000 plus mourners in attendance. Reverend Thomas Keyes called upon the perpetrator of the crime to free the Sun family by coming forward so that the tragedy could be put to rest. Carol's family launched the Carol Sund Carrington Memorial Reward Foundation, which facilitated rewards for information to help families find missing loved ones. Before long, the foundation experienced its first success story. The offer of a $10,000 reward led to the arrest of a suspect who shot and killed a young man named Robert Ibarra. The foundation also offered a reward to help solve the murder of 18-year-old Brittany Phillips, as covered in episode 146 of Case File. The FBI released Carol and Sylvina's remains 37 days after they were discovered. Jose and Raquel Peloso had since returned home to Argentina to await the arrival of Sylvina's remains. Her body was transported to Raquel's hometown of Las Verichas. Residents lined the streets and threw roses at the hearse as it made its journey. Local factories and shops along the route were closed as a sign of respect. Over 1,000 mourners gathered for Silvina's funeral. Her father said, We're at the end of a very painful story for us all. But finally, Sylvina is going to be able to rest in peace. Having Sylvina here is a huge relief. Yosemite National Park was federal property. Given that the murders were carried out there, a federal grand jury was pulled to assist authorities with the case. Although no arrests were imminent, This would give authorities more power to obtain documents and subpoena reluctant or interstate witnesses. The criminal records of local men were poured over to identify suspects, and those who had been convicted of violent crimes were spotlighted. One such person was Cedar Lodge janitor Billy Joe Strange, who was still in custody for violating his probation. 38-year-old car thief Terry Ray also caught investigators' attention. He was a known associate of persons of interest in the Sund Peloso case. On April 6, Terry's heavily decomposed body was found in the Tuolumne River. It appeared as though he had been in the water for up to three weeks. Terry's brother, Dennis, was certain Terry had met with foul play. According to Dennis, Terry had been at a house in Modesto several weeks earlier where he witnessed Julie's son to being assaulted. Dennis believed that his brother had been drugged and dumped in the river to stop him from speaking out about the crime. He said Terry was a strong swimmer who wouldn't have drowned accidentally. Yet, An autopsy failed to uncover any evidence that implicated anyone else in Terry Ray's death. Another man who made the suspect list in the Sund Peloso case was 42-year-old Michael Larwick. Larwick was a convicted rapist who had also served time for manslaughter, assault, drug possession and attempted prison escape. In 1975, 
He brutally raped a relative while her children cowered in a nearby car. Two days prior to the discovery of the burnt-out Pontiac, Larwick was involved in a 14-hour standoff with police. He had been caught driving with expired license plates. During negotiations, Larwick fired a rifle at a police car and the standoff concluded with his arrest. Larwick's half-brother, 32-year-old Eugene Dykes, also raised suspicions. He too had a long criminal history that included unlawful sexual intercourse and false imprisonment. Dykes had been in custody since March 5 for parole violations, with his parole officer labelling him a danger to the community. Both Larwick and Dykes were known to hang around a group of methamphetamine addicts who supported their habit via mail theft and forgery. This raised the question of whether they'd been involved with the fraudulent calls to Wells Fargo to gain access to Carol Sun's bank cards and accounts. The half-brothers quickly became the likely suspects in the Yosemite sightseer murders as it was thought that the crime was carried out by more than one perpetrator. In addition, the pair were familiar with the local area and Larwick regularly spent time at a home in Modesto, 10 blocks from where Carol's wallet insert was found. By early April, the grand jury began interviewing witnesses to build a compelling case against Michael Larwick and Eugene Dykes. By now, attention had fully shifted from the Cedar Lodge in El Portal to the Modesto neighbourhoods and trailer parks where the methamphetamine trade thrived. Special Agent James Maddock expressed confidence over the new direction the investigation was taking. After months of inactivity, Progress was now being made. He told the press. It's remarkable, when you look at it, all the pieces we've been able to fill in. Every day we get information that helps us refine our working theory. Eugene Dykes's girlfriend was among those interviewed. She said that she knew in her heart that her boyfriend was involved in the murders. She then recalled the day Dykes was arrested for violating parole. He had arrived at her house high on methamphetamine. After ordering her to close all the doors and windows, he handed her a knife and a gun and told her to hide them. The police arrived at the house to arrest Dykes and seized both weapons. They asked his girlfriend if she had ever seen Dykes with an axe or saw blades. She said no, but explained that he usually carried another blade in addition to the gun. Another associate of the suspects was 41-year-old methamphetamine dealer Larry Utley. In late May, he held a man captive at his home in Modesto. He planned to drug the man in order to steal his bank cards. Three days later, The man told Utley he needed fresh air. Utley obliged, and the man took the opportunity to escape. Utley was arrested for kidnapping and criminal conspiracy. He underwent polygraph testing, during which he denied having anything to do with the Yosemite sightseer murders. Results revealed he was being truthful. Twelve days later, Police arrested 24-year-old Modesto local Kenneth Stewart for stabbing and attempting to shoot an ex-con he had served time with. Stewart was a known associate of Eugene Dykes. Police hoped that arresting Stewart would pressure him into disclosing anything he might know about the Yosemite murders, but he remained tight-lipped. Yet another suspect on the FBI's radar was 46-year-old Tuolumne County man Paul Candler Jr. He owned a house in the Yosemite area that had burned down around the time Carol, Julie and Sylvina went missing. 
Candler had since fled to Alabama to evade authorities after threatening to kill his mother. The FBI went to extreme lengths to extradite him back to California to face questioning over the Yosemite sightseer murders. To the FBI, the investigation into Michael Larwick and Eugene Dykes had been a success. Special Agent Maddox stated that although they weren't close to announcing any arrests in relation to the Sund Peloso case, the FBI believed that those responsible were in custody for unrelated crimes. They had yet to conclusively link any of the aforementioned suspects to the murders due to what Maddox described as a crankster circle of dopers who can't remember what they did yesterday much less weeks ago. Complicating matters was the lack of a motive or physical evidence. With Yosemite's summer tourist season underway, an FBI spokesperson clarified that the public had no reasons to be concerned, as, quote, This case is not a manhunt for serial killers still on the loose. In mid-June, Eugene Dykes made a confession to police. He revealed that he and his half-brother, Michael Larwick, had participated in the abduction and murder of Carol and Julie Sund and Sylvina Peloso. He said he hadn't killed them, but had been involved in giving away their personal belongings, including checks and jewellery. He had another associate discard Carol's wallet insert in Modesto. Dykes later changed this story. This time, he claimed he had cut Carol's throat with a knife at a remote mountain location. He also said he had helped dispose of the bodies. Dykes was strapped to a polygraph and asked if he had harmed Sylvina. He answered no. The test indicated he was being deceptive. An acquaintance of Dykes agreed to wear a covert listening device while speaking to a teenage girl Dykes had been sexually involved with. During the conversation, the teen said that Dykes had admitted to her that he and another man had slit the throats of three women. She also revealed that she had helped Dykes create a fake ID using Carol Sund's driver's license. It was a compelling conversation, but investigators were unable to find any evidence to support it. They did uncover a ring that Dykes claimed to have stolen from Julie Sund. It was shown to her sister Regina, who said she was 90% sure it was Julie's. The FBI felt the ring supported Dyke's confession. They searched a Jeep Wagoneer that Dyke said he'd been driving at the time of the abductions. They also examined a Corvette that belonged to his half-brother. Both vehicles contained dark pink fibres akin to those found on Julie's body. The same fibres were also found on one of Dyke's jackets. The evidence was beginning to stack up. However, Dykes kept changing his story. His statements were inconsistent and he was unwilling or unable to prove his involvement. An FBI agent said, These guys are pathologically incapable of telling a straight story. In Dykes' own warped mind, he's trying to shift the ultimate responsibility to someone else. Another agent said, Dykes has made statements that are very self-incriminating, as well as statements that are incriminating of others. It's impossible at this time to say what part is true and what isn't. Dykes is talking to get the onus off him and onto his brother. He's trying to confuse people, trying to save himself retribution in prison. From his jail cell, Dykes agreed to an interview with the Associated Press. He denied having anything to do with the murders, adding, If I was involved, 
it wasn't through my knowledge. By the five-month anniversary of the murders, no arrests had been made. Twenty-six-year-old Joey Armstrong worked as a naturalist for the Yosemite Institute, a not-for-profit organisation that ran education programs through a partnership with the park. Her job was to teach children about the animals, plants, environment and ecosystem of Yosemite. Joey cared deeply for the environment. She was a vegetarian who would inform her friends and family about how to recycle. One of her superiors said, Joey was one of the finest naturalists and science teachers I ever met. Joey had recently moved in with her boyfriend Michael and another co-worker to a cabin in Foresta. The remote, unincorporated community was on the western edge of Yosemite. Joey's cabin was surrounded by woods and meadows. She loved her home and lifestyle, telling a friend it was straight out of a dream. Although the recent murders had unnerved her, Joey told her mother that she felt safe knowing that the people responsible were in custody. In her diary, she wrote, The monsters are gone. In late July 1999, Joey was preparing to visit a friend in Sausalito, a small seaside town 180 miles west of Yosemite. She had packed her car and was ready to leave by the afternoon of Thursday, July 22. At 3am the next morning, a call was placed to the Yosemite National Park authorities. Joey's friend had phoned in worried as Joey never showed up to their place as planned. Officials headed to Joey's cabin to conduct a welfare check. Music was playing inside, but nobody was home. Joey's bed was in disarray, a pair of sunglasses were broken on the floor, and a bright red rag appeared to be out of place. Her car was still parked outside, packed and ready for her trip to Sausalito. Given it was dark outside, Park officials waited until first light to carry out a search of the immediate area. When the search commenced, hours passed without any discoveries. At 1pm, park rangers ventured to a stream just a few hundred yards from Joey's cabin. Among an area of trampled vegetation, they stumbled across the decapitated body of a young woman. To be continued next week.